Yeah. 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 We're live. Great. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this live English class. For those of you, some stuff flying around in my room. Sometimes when I'm doing a video, some thing will float up like a piece of dust or a hair or something will float up and I see it in front of the camera. And so I think, okay, it's going to stop. But then it stops in front of the camera. Why wouldn't it stop out of view? Why does it always stop in the worst place? Sometimes you think the universe is just, you know, against you. The universe is putting hairs in my way. What was I saying? Right. English learners, welcome. Welcome. Good to have you here. Hope you're ready to learn some English. I have some cool stuff to share with you. It's been a little while since I've done one of these, so I'm excited about it. My name is Luke. I'm an English teacher from the United States, and I'm here to answer your English questions. If you have questions about pronunciation, about grammar, about idioms and phrases, about culture, <coughs> about the symptoms to seasonal illnesses, which I may have, then let me know. And also, I would appreciate here at the start, if you could hit the like button, the thumbs up button, subscribe. That helps the channel a lot, especially the like button. You don't think the like button is important? Not only me, but if you support someone when you watch their video, always hit the like button. Because it's very important for the algorithms to then tell other people about it, right? So if you if there's one thing you're going to do to show support to creators that you like and want to support, that's how you do it. That is the number one. Or you can you can uh, buy the things that they mention in their uh, content, such as courses. I have uh, uh, right now 10 courses. If you're interested in improving your English more seriously, you want to uh, take your English to the next level, then check out my courses, full courses on pronunciation, grammar, all of that fun stuff. Well, not necessarily fun. I try to make it fun for you. And uh, I don't always succeed, but I do try my best. Let me quickly update the cover photo. <coughs> Maybe if I drink more coffee, that that will that will help. Um, okay, I'm gonna update the photo here, and then we can get get started. Share the link to the WhatsApp group. Just a second, guys. Just a second. I've got everything I need. I've got coffee very important i've got a big bottle of water this uh this bottle there's every time i buy a bottle for water to drink out of i think this is the one this is the one the last one i bought so there's a really good one but it's not transparent i like to see my progress right i like to see oh i, I had this much today that's pretty good right uh, so that's my first requirement. I bought another one, but then inside of the filter of the straw, it would get these little black particles. I didn't like that. So then I tried this one, and I thought, this one is the one. This one is the one. But it's got a weird smell. It smells like pickles. Why make it smell like pickles? Can't there, can't there ever be just a perfect thing? Does there always have to be something that's wrong with it that's my question all right i think we're good sorry about rambling about pickles and water bottles i should open up the comments i haven't done that yet uh, i'm behind the game i'm behind the game today all right we're good to go. I see we've got Jocker here, Min, Oma, Omoa. English with Joe. Hey, Joe. Joe's hitting the, the like button. Awesome. Karina's here. Fla's here. 
Mevi is here. Mohammed is here. Vissel is here. Raquette is here. Emma Studying Arts is here. A for Anna. Wow, a lot of people here. Fantastic. So if anyone can recommend me, just to go back to my topic, a good water bottle that has a filter in it, uh, let me know. Because so far, I got one that smells like pickles. I got one that smells like pickles and one that gets these black things. And I, it's, it drives me crazy. Wash it with bleach. Are you talking about the other one? Yeah, I tried that. Didn't work. It's weird. It's weird. All right. So we're going to talk about, of course, some learning strategies today. Um, I have something to share with you, which I think should be interesting. I hope. We'll see. But also, but also give me your questions. Uh, this is, as usual, the Q&A, where I hope you can ask questions about anything but especially English culture related stuff. I mean, you're welcome to, to ask me anything you like, but um, you know, I'm kind of here for, I don't know anything about anything but English, right? Um, I'm, I'm a know nothing except for when it comes to English language learning. Phila says, I can understand your speech, but I can't talk. I know the feeling. Vissel says, it's been a while. Yes, it has. I've been really busy. Um, one thing I'm doing is I'm working on recording more courses, something I'm very excited about. I'm in the middle of working on and recording more English courses. And it's fun, but it's also, you know, it's a big struggle. Like after this, this live stream, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be recording for a while. And... Um, yeah, a lot of stuff going on, uh, but uh, I'm going to get back into the habit. The live streams are something that's hard for me to give a, you know, follow a concrete schedule, a clear schedule, but that is in the plans. So for this year, especially in the second half of this year, maybe after July, maybe, then I'm going to create a schedule where every week at these times, uh, maybe twice or three times a week. Every week we do it. There's a regular time. And so I know people are asking about that. Hey, when are these? <laughs> uh, I try to make them as regular as possible, but sometimes I just don't get to it. And it, which, which sucks because I like doing these. I love doing live streams. It's one of my favorite things to do. So, uh, uh, uh. Do you have any recommended Netflix shows for improving English recently? I haven't been watching much Netflix, to be honest with you. <coughs> Sorry. Mohammed says, what do you think about italki? Okay. Well, I'm going to take on that question first. 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 You love watching... Oh, thank you so much, Min. I appreciate that. I love I love doing the live streams. Super fun. Especially when there are great questions. Nothing more fun than that. I mean, it's a challenge for me to answer questions in a logical way uh, without really preparing for them, you know. What's the best way to create flashcards? It is by typing a sentence on the front side of the card with your native language and translation on the back side. <sighs> That's an interesting one because there are different systems for it. And um, sometimes, yeah, we'll talk about that too. All right, let's try to get to some of these cool, good questions here. A for Anna says, how to start thinking in English then translating the sentence to English. Maybe we could say, how can I start thinking in English instead of translating sentences to English? Which is very important, right? Because if you're always thinking in your own language and then translating over from one language to the next, uh, back and forth all the time, then every time you say something, you have to carry around a big bag of the other thing. 
right? I want to I want to say this sentence in English, so I have to carry around a huge bag of my own language that goes along with that, and I have to go back and forth every time, pull a hundred things out of the bag. It's very tiring. It's exhausting. I don't want to do that, and you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't have to do that, right? And there is this sort of standard answer that teachers give. Well, you have to surround yourself with the language. You have to you have to start using the language and learning in the language, learning other things in the language. Immerse yourself. And that is right. That is a correct <clears throat> that is a correct answer, right? But it's not as simple as just saying that you have English all around you, consuming English all the time. That helps. But also you have to have the right attitude when doing that, right? So I so I have a course called Building Your English Brain and it's all about it's all about how to think in English, strategies for doing it, exercises for doing it. But the most important thing is to separate yourself from this assumption that if you know how to say something in English, then you have to know how to say that exact thing in your own language. That is an assumption that is not necessarily true. And in fact, if you meet, sorry about the sirens, there's a, there must be some sort of emergency near my house. You hear that? Must be a bad day out there. Hope they're okay. So if you meet someone who is bilingual or a polyglot fully, right, and they're speaking in English at a, at a native level, they're speaking in another language, Chinese or French at another, uh, at, at also a native, wow, that's really loud, at a native level. If, if you ask this person, right, how do I say this idiom in English? How do I say that in French? How do I say this idiom in Chinese? They might, and I, I've interviewed a lot of people who are really good at three, four, five languages, they might think for a second. And sometimes they'll say, I don't know. Um, I guess it would be something like, and then they'll try. So there is this assumption that when I'm learning English, I have to always relate my own language to it. That if I don't know how to say it in my language, I don't really know it. But that's not what an English brain is. Building an English brain is building a way of thinking and a mindset that doesn't have your language in it and not assuming, assuming that you don't have to know what that is in your language, right? And for me, when I, when I say some things in Chinese, I often don't know how to say that in English. Like there are a lot of food items, for example, in Chinese. I have no idea how to say them in English. But why would I need to know how to say them in English? As long as I can say them in Chinese and get done what I need to get done, that's fine. So that's the first step is to just get this idea out of your mind that there has to be a connection between them. There does not. Okay. So think of yourself kind of like a baby. When you're learning the English language, if you learn an idiom and you understand it and you know how to use it and you see how people use it, oh, you use it in this situation. Oh, that's interesting. Don't go a step further and say, all right, now that I know that, I'm going to try to connect it back to my language. That's my safe space. That's my foundation. I'm going to bring it back to my comfort zone and I'm going to pull it into my language. No, stop before you do that and say, it's good enough to just know it in English. And I'll stop there. And if you ask me, how do you say that in your language? I might say, I don't know. I don't know. Because it really doesn't matter. Okay. So that's the first thing. The right, the right attitude or the right way of thinking about it. And then all the other stuff. And then, yes, surround yourself with the language. Try to immerse yourself. Get involved in online English communities. Uh, do do groups where people are talking about things, not learning the language, but talking about other things. Find an interest and then pursue that interest in an English community or pursue that interest with English, whatever it may be. Read, read books. And when you read, don't assume that you have to look up every word 
in English. Try to figure it out from the context. Listen to podcasts, watch movies, and constantly push yourself out of your comfort zone. And you'll find that your comfort zone will change over time. But always remind yourself, if I don't know how to say it in my language, that's okay. It doesn't matter. Because native English speakers clearly don't know it in my language, so therefore it's not necessary. Okay, that is what, that is the definition of thinking in English. That is the definition of an English brain. Hope that makes sense. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and also check out my full courses in the links in the description. All right. Okay. Okay, okay. More people joining. John Jin is here. Thanks a lot for the Old Man and the Sea book recommendation. Awesome. Glad you like it. I can totally vouch for this. I'm almost bilingual and a translator and collocation dictionaries exist for a reason. You absolutely grasp the context, but don't necessarily have the translation. Bingo. That's exactly right. Um, you know, I, I realized that the Chinese, exp there, there's an English expression, right? And the English expression is, um, long time no see. And I realized after a while that the Chinese expression, uh, hao jiu bu jian, is the same thing. And it might be that the English is from the Chinese right? But I didn't make that connection in my mind. I never connected those two things together at first. I just, I know, know this one here. I know how that pe people use that one. I know this one over here and I know how people use that and that's enough. And then I realized one day, oh, wait a second, one might come from the other. But then the next realization was, but who cares, right? Who cares? When you're in one language, just be in that language and don't worry about anything else. A translator, collocation dictionaries exist. So a collocation dictionary will will give you the surrounding meaning, not just the meaning itself, right? Um, to, to understand something in a situation is to understand it. To understand something because you know what it means is not necessarily to understand it, right? If I gave you the word... Um, if I gave you the word undulate and I just told you what it meant could you go out and just use it naturally not necessarily probably not because it is used in some very specific situations but not in others and there are words that are similar in meaning to that word undulate which really have nothing to do with the other context so you have to get a feeling for it. And that is not a comfortable thing at first for a lot of learners. What do you mean I have to get a feeling for it? You mean it's not just a, oh, now I've learned it checklist sort of thing? Yeah, that's right. It's a very messy process of getting a feeling for it. And you have to kind of be comfortable, get comfortable with that. Obscura Cam uh, Camaria is a cool name, by the way. Very cool. Ah, is the Obscura Camaria, Camaria, is that one of those cabinets with the lens in it? Is that, that's very familiar. In my case, Spanish collocation dictionaries. Spanish is my mother tongue. Uh, tell you which words fit best. Hand in hand, they're helpful to make an okay translation into a native sounding one. Okay. Nazdam. Tanya is here. Hello, Tanya. Uh, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? I'm going to skip the Netflix question because uh, I haven't been watching Netflix recently. Mohammed says, what do you think about italki? Useful? or not? All right, so Muhammad's question. First, what is italki? I think that's how you say it. It's a website where you can find teachers, private teachers, uh, to have lessons with you, uh, 
one to one. I believe they're all one to one. I haven't checked the website in a while. And you can sign up for, I think, one lesson or several lessons or packages of lessons. I've never done it. So just a little context. I've I've taught individually. I ran a company uh, similar to italki in some ways. Um, so I'm familiar with the, the model. Um, and and they're, it, they're just different. So the one I did was called Yoli. And we did on-demand classes. So you could take a class with a native speaking teacher. And whenever you wanted, you would just poke a button and it would connect you with a teacher and you'd do a short lesson. And it was only only on your phone, right? It was it was a really fun, really cool project. The project ended last year, so the company got acquired by another company. So then there's italki. And italki is a different model. You find a teacher you like, and then you sign up for classes with them, and you can usually take a demo class with them. So the key is finding a teacher you like. And that's really the question. They have quite a few teachers, so you probably can. But I can also say that it's very important to try a lesson first. Right? Before you sign up with any teacher, always try a lesson. Because ratings can be gamed. Uh, sometimes uh, you just got to be careful with the rating thing. I mean, it's a good indication. You want to look at ratings. Ratings are a good indication, but always then do the next thing. And the next thing would be to try a class. So yeah, I would say it's good in that you can find a teacher, but you have to do the work to find the teacher. And just because someone has really great ratings doesn't mean that they are the teacher for you. Because a teacher and a student, it's a relationship. The teacher is there to help you, but you have to do the work to actually improve yourself, to get better, and you're kind of using the teacher's knowledge and ability to point things out and um, give you direction and explain things to you clearly. You're using that teacher to get to the next stage, to progress. Uh, but if you have the wrong teacher and it's not the right match, it doesn't mean they're not a good teacher. It might mean that it's just, the not, it's just not a right match for you. It's not a good fit. There's something about personality types there too. So make sure it's not only someone who's very highly rated. Make sure it's someone who's highly rated, who you like. You enjoy their company. You like to talk to them. You feel they understand you. And very importantly, a good teacher, this is a test you can do. A good teacher should be able to, in a demo class that hopefully you can get for free. I'm not sure if they do free or very cheap uh, demo classes, but if you do a trial class, if you want to know if they're a good teacher or not, the one thing that you can use as a, uh, a way to judge that is whether or not they can give you very specific feedback that you can use right away. So if you ever hear a teacher say something like, right, you've, you've talked, you've been talking about a topic, right, because you have to talk in order for the teacher to get a sense for where you need to improve, right? If you don't say anything, they don't know how you should improve. So you talk for a while about a topic, and then the teacher says, okay, well, that was very good. N nothing too bad with saying very good encouragement. That's nice. But if they say then, I think you need to work on your, your verb tenses. Or I think, uh, I think one thing you need to improve is your confidence. Okay? That's nonsense. Okay? Because any teacher can say that to anyone. And it, they're not actually giving you specific feedback. If any teacher ever says that to you as feedback, and that's all they say, get rid of them immediately and find another one. They should be able to tell you specifically. When you were talking about this, you used the passive, the, the, the past perfect tense, and you shouldn't have used the past perfect tense because, and instead you should have used the simple past tense because and explain to you based specifically on things that you said. If they can't do that, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with them. Um, and, you know, let them know your requirements, but they should be able to give you extremely specific feedback. Otherwise, it's just a practice partner, in which case, why do you need a teacher? So that's just my opinion based on my experience and uh, my, my background. So 
take that for what it is. And I hope you find a good teacher on italki or any other platform where you can where you can find teachers. I should probably do a full review on that at some point. Thanks for the question, uh, Mohammed. I appreciate that. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. Also, hit the like button, and that supports the channel a lot. And also, check out my full courses, English courses, in the links in the description. Okay, awesome. Awesome! There's nothing free on italki. Oh, you have to pay for the trial. Eey, oh, okay. <coughs> well, fair enough. If anyone wants to see what it looks like, I'd be happy to show you, right? Like, uh, if there's someone who... Uh, should we do this? Yeah. Yeah, if anyone if anyone wants to do a trial class with me right now, brave souls in front of everyone else, uh let me know. We can get on a get on a call on on the live stream. I like to do risky things. It's fun. Muhammad, what did you think of iTalki overall? What was your experience? What have you worked for me lately? Uh to read or to listen a video of a random topic, then rewrite a whole different story using the words shown in the video or text. <laughs> Is that a question, uh, Julio? It would have been a while. What does this mean exactly? In what kind of situation can we use this would have been? Mm, situation. Yeah, there, okay, that's a good question. Let me think of a situation when we would use that. Would have been a while. Let me think about that one. A good situation. Let me let me get back to you on that. Nahat? Okay. Seriously, Nahat, are you up for it? Beto says, Luke, new sub, you're cool and thanks for your help. All right, this could be a huge disaster, but uh, Nihat, do you have a way of reaching me? If you want to try to do like a five minute class and I can give you some feedback, um, I'm down to try it. It's extremely risky um, and it could be a disaster, but why the heck not? What is the best course for Learn Native U.S. English? I don't know if you have a way to to reach out, uh, Nahat. Um, maybe I can. Maybe I can give you my email. Do you have my email, or can you find my email? You know what? You can go to, you can go to my website. Just go to cloud.english and go to the bottom, and just submit your email and I'll send you a link and we can do that. Cloudenglish.net. That's the website. Cloudenglish.net. Go to the bottom and then you'll see a contact form. I will get your email and then I will respond with a link and then you can hop on and we'll do a, we'll do a class. Okay. Mohammed says, I have all including Udemy. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Let me pull up a class for Nihat. Nihat, what would you say your average level is? If you were going to put a uh, a number on that out of 100. 80? 70? 40? Okay. Oh, that, would, that one could be good. Ninety-nine. Jeez, that's pretty high. All right. If Nahat's English is that good, maybe I don't have good feedback. We'll give it a try. 
Hold on, let me make sure my email is open so I can get that from you. All right, in the meantime, let's take another question. I'm gonna think about the would have question. Uh, but before that, I wanted to go back to the flashcard one. Yes, this one. Everything Everywhere says, hey, what's the best way to create a flashcard? Is it by typing in a sentence on the front side of the card with your native language and a translation in your target language on the back side? So it depends. There are a lot of different ways to do flashcards. And you just have to you know, be aware that flashcards aren't necessarily the aren't necessarily the best way to learn words. I'm not saying you shouldn't use them. They can be very powerful for remembering things. Absolutely. But they're not necessarily the best way to um, to learn. Because if you, for example, learn a phrase and you remember it and you know exactly what it means, do you know how to use it? Right? So just keep that in mind. Now, making flashcards. If you find the process of making the flashcard useful in actually learning, then yeah, it makes sense to build them by yourself. Now, let's say it's an idiom, right? So if it's an idiom, you might want to put the idiom on the front and then on the back, you could put a couple different things. You could put what it means or you could put an example that tells you what it is. Now, if you want to write it in your language, you could. But I wouldn't recommend that. For idioms, I would stay away from I would stay away from your language. I would do a description of the meaning on the back or an example that shows the meaning on the back. You could you could do either way, but I would I would recommend doing it with only one language if you can, because that's going to push you to improve faster. Now, the most accepted or widely used version of flashcards is something called spaced repetition. So spaced repetition is the idea that at a certain rate you repeat cards. So for that reason it's probably better to do digital cards or use an app that does spaced repetition than doing actual physical flashcards. Because with actual physical flashcards your mind might get used to the the pattern and that might be the thing that's helping you remember it. But if you use spaced repetition, it spreads it out so that as you start to forget it the first time, then it will bring it up. And then there's a shorter period of time for the second repetition, and, a, and then it gets longer and longer and longer until you know it. So they, they have it spaced out exactly at the right, it's called intervals with spaced repetition, and that sort of tricks your mind into grabbing onto it so that you can keep it long term. The one that's really popular is called Anki. So Anki is a flashcard system for a lot of different things and medical students use it and a lot of people use use Anki. So I would recommend checking that out um, but I, I would I would suggest maybe staying away from the physical cards. That's kind of an outdated method unless you have a really good way to make sure that the spacing is is right to make sure that you're able to um, uh, see it at the right time to improve or maximize your ability to remember it so that's good and fine but just keep in mind that really what you're trying to do is learn something that you can use, right? So I think the most powerful way to learn a word or a phrase or an idiom is to make sentences with it. Once you learn it, you know it, you know what it means, you've seen it in a couple other examples, make your own examples, write your own down. And if you do that, you're more likely to remember it more quickly. If it's just recall, right, that's great. You know it, you remembered it, but can you use it? Language is Language exists to be used to interact with other human beings, and so the best way to learn it is to use it. So I would strongly encourage you to consider 
not only flashcards and maybe not flashcards at all, but some other way that involves a usage of the, the word, usage of the idiom uh, instead, or do both if you want to use flashcards. Anki is, is pretty well um, well known as a, a, a good, good way to do spaced repetitions. So that's it for that. If you have any other questions about that, let me know. Uh, there's another app. Um, what's it called? I use one for other things. What's it called? What's it called? I can't remember what it's called. There's another app that I can't remember the name of right now, but if you look it up in the App Store, you should be able to just search flashcards and you can find it uh, in your App Store um, based on popularity. I think it's another spaced repetition one. So if you have any other questions, let me know. If you guys haven't already, don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please check out the full courses in the links in the description. Some of the courses cover idioms, for example. So if you're interested in learning idioms, that would be a good, or rather those four courses would be good to check out because they talk about, they cover the um, context of an idiom, not just the meaning, right? I talk about in each one, it's the same format. So first we talk about the pronunciation, then we talk about the basic meaning, then we go into examples. How is this actually used? So uh, I mean it as a powerful way to actually learn, and then I encourage you to make your own examples for each one. And uh, it's over 200, uh, 200 idioms for all those courses combined. All right. Let's see, what have we got? Oh, it's getting cold. My feet are cold. I feel like I feel cold. David Harara. Still haven't got an email from uh, Nihat. Hi, Luke. In order to practice English, could you recommend us? You sent your email. I've got no email. I have seen nothing. <laughs> nothing, 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 nothing. I'm looking at it right now. Maybe it's just delayed. Um, I have used Quizlet to make flashcards. It has helped a lot to increase vocabulary. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, just make sure you're doing usage too. I think I've heard of Quizlet, but I don't know if I've used that one. Hi, Luke. In order to practice English, could you recommend us some apps or platforms to find uh, native speakers? Yeah, I mean, there's the one I was talking about earlier called italki. And um, I'm, I'm not giving a strong recommendation for that, but there, there aren't, as far as I know, many great ones out there. Uh, uh, there's another one called, uh, what's it called? What's the other one called? Or, or, no, I can't remember. There's a free talk one. I can't remember the name of it. But it's just free talk, so I'm not sure if it's great. Um, so yeah, italki might be the most popular one at the moment. It might be. Uh, is it possible to add Arabic subtitles in your videos? Uh, kind of tough. I mean, adding subtitles in all languages is really expensive. Uh, so I'm not sure if I can afford it at this point. Someday. Sounds interesting, but I think printing is just a waste of time, and then I get bored. Oh, maybe you have. Maybe you're not writing the own, the the right things. Maybe you're not. Uh, maybe you're not doing something interesting enough to you. Maybe you should start a blog and write about what you care about. Give yourself a purpose rather than just writing. Right. Sometimes having a purpose makes a big difference. I'm not just writing example sentences. I'm writing a blog about my life, things that I care about, things that I'm interested in. Then? Then would you be interested? Might change things, right? Ah, Nihat. All right, there he is. We're going to try this thing. It might be a bad idea, but um, we're going to try it. We're going to try it. Give me a second, guys.
Okay, sent. See how it goes. See if he gets it. Okay, you forgot to tell us the use of would have been. Yeah, okay, well, I can do would have been. That's pretty easy, right? So let's say would have been. If something, so, so Sajad asks or says, you forgot to tell us about would have been. So let's just use would have been. That keeps it simple. So whenever you see would, right, would is usually used for hypotheticals. Something that's not real that we're imagining, right? Would have been is used usually to talk about an imaginary thing that didn't happen in the past, usually, but we're imagining it happening in a kind of imaginary space, right? So, for example, I might say, I might say, it would have been great if you had come to the party. It would have been great. Does that mean you came to the party? No, you didn't. But I'm imagining you coming in another universe in which you did. And using would allows me to move into that space of not real things, imaginary things. In this case, imaginary things in the past that did or didn't happen, right? You didn't come to the party. So it was great, but it would have been great if you had come, maybe even better, right? That's a simple way to use it, right? Would have seen, would have done, this is also a way to talk about possibilities, imaginary possibilities. Notice that it's been. Notice that it's seen. Notice that it's done. Notice that it's taken, eaten. This is called the past participle. Okay, The past participle is a tense, a verb, that we use for specific situations, specific types of sentences. Right? After have, especially for, for example, present perfect tense, and especially when we're making these hypotheticals, we use the past participle, right? So let's make another example, right? I would have become a scientist if I had taken biology class more seriously in high school. I would have become a biologist. Am I a biologist? Did I become a biologist? No. Hypothetical. Not real. So this would have been. Been. Were. These are great ways to bring up things, to mention things that we're just thinking about. We're just imagining them. Or we can use would to talk about things going on now or not going on now, right? It would be great if you could please, it would be great if you could please let her know, right? I'm just imagining that you that you are going to let her know. And that's a way to talk about a request kind of indirectly. So you can use these would in other ways too. In this specific case, this would have, and then the past participle is for these past imaginary things that allow us to explore how things might have been, how things would have been before. And that might then change the way things are now. If I would have, if I would have traveled throughout Europe in my 20s, now I think I, I would be a more interesting person. Mm, okay. All hypothetical. Not real. I didn't do that. But if I had, I would maybe have more stories to share, more interesting experiences, that sort of thing. So I hope that's useful. I hope that answers the question more or less. But it's really good to check out examples, to read examples of this, uh, to get more uh, a, a better picture of it. Okay, Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button. Of course, subscribe. Subscribe. And check out my full courses in the links in the description. Okay. <clears throat> Looks like we've got Nihat here. See if this works. This could be interesting.
guest is in the green room. All right. Hello. Hey, hey. Can you hear me okay? Hey, I'm good. Can you hear me well? I can hear you very well, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yep. cool. Can you hear me? Hey, how are you? hello, people. Hello, hello. I'd like to welcome you all from Istanbul, Turkey now. You're in Istanbul, hey. Turkey. <laughs> right, uh-huh. Right. Ah, okay. So I've seen you in the there. comments. It's interesting to see you, to, to, to meet you here like this. Yeah, me too. Exactly. I've been following you for a long time. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I should I do this kind of thing more often. Just bring people on randomly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh-huh. But I keep, uh, I am, mm -hmm. well, I've been, so let me close this part, but it's a lot better. What about the transmission? It's better. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. I think okay. it's hold it. Okay, fine. Right, but the camera stopped a little. Okay, fine. You're okay though. Right, I, can well, see, I can see. You. I'm Turkish as well as I'm an American citizen. I've lived in the states for many years. I am from uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, and now for the past two years, um, I'm back in Turkey. I've been teaching English for the EFL students. And here we have the Turkish American University Association. And so here we are, and I've been following you. I'm a great admirer of you. It's wonderful. And so, how else? So, how are things with you and the family? And well, could, I, fine. Could, I, could I ask you a couple of questions? Because one thing I want to try to do is, sure. if you don't mind, I'm hoping I can, yeah. I can listen to you a little more so that. Even though you're an English teacher, sure. I can I can give you a, I can give you some feedback, <laughs> and you're welcome to give me some as well. I'm sure. So Please could you Please could you that. tell me Please a little more about your language journey? Could you tell me a little bit more about uh, uh, sure. your, how early did you start? Uh, what were the struggles that you faced along the way, and how did you get to a point where now you're speaking English uh, at a very high level and and using it on a daily basis? Right. Well, it's a great one. So I started English, well, since I've known myself. The thing is that I was very lucky enough to have my father who was dealing with an American company and we had to travel a lot. So I didn't have to go to school to learn English. It's like the word to be, to learn, to do, or whatever. So it all came automatically. And also I've been very interested in languages. And so let me see. Okay, so this goes up here. So can, what about the transmission? Is it good now? It's can fine. Yeah, no it's good. Sure. Okay, fine. Because yeah, sometimes it you know freezes and everything. Fine. <clears throat> and well, and since well, I've lived in the United States for many years, that helps me a lot learning or improving the language. Since I'm in the process of learning, I feel that learning a language isn't it doesn't end in a span or in a sense. So with the with my students as well as with my educators. We are still in the process of learning it. It's wonderful. And so every single day, we get to learn a lot of new things, as well as we are teaching the same. And what the grammatical, well, well, the way I uh, also gotten the CELTA degree. CELTA is like a university renowned language. Mm, they're teaching how to, it's a very useful, I'm very, I'm very happy. I feel very fortunate enough to have joined the class for CELTA. Uh, you get to learn new dimensions and the way to approach students. Well, I used to be more, well, this has been my 11th year in teaching. Well, I remember myself were like more still teacher centered. Now, sorry, I mean, you know, I'm you know, throwing the ball to the students so that I could make them talk even, even my elementary level students, really. It's How so, do you, so what's your teaching? Could different. you talk about your teaching method a little bit? What is your, what is your method for, for teaching? Well, the method for teaching is something like, well, it comes in simultaneous, well, it depends on the class. It depends on the people that I'm teaching for. For example, uh, the class that I'm teaching right now started like pre-intermediate, and then they are in intermediate level, and the English level is pretty well, and their, their English abilities in both in speaking and understanding, and as well as writing, it's improved a lot. So we are dealing some things like, much more like uh, student-centered, so that's what I'm doing it, rather than dealing with a lot of grammatical things. It's not always very 
uh, let's say, well, people get really bored of uh, teaching or learning grammar to deal with the grammar a lot. Like we have to talk about the third person singular or whatever. So, okay, then they understand like through speaking perhaps or through reading a lot. So this is something that I definitely recommend uh, our friends here as well so that they could do more. Listen, I, I always keep telling them, please try to listen anything that you can. Either yeah. like CNN or, uh, no, not in particular, but some things like whatever. Yeah, pull off CNN your, and Fox yeah, News, right? Fire. Balance it out politically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, some people would call it like constant, you know, <laughs> yeah. news network. Well, okay, yeah. I try not to watch too much news or I get I get depressed. So, well, thank you for telling me a little more about about your story and your journey and that uh-huh. you you teach. That's fantastic. One of the reasons I I, I reached out to the to the chat to see if someone was joining is I wanted to see I wanted people to see what it would look like to you know have a mm-hmm. give give specific feedback. So, I wonder if it's okay mm-hmm. with you if if because I've been I've been just taking a few notes. I know you're an English teacher, but I wonder if it's okay with you if I give you a little a little Fine. feedback. Is that okay? <laughs> sure. <Why> okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're. I mean, you're, obviously, you're at a very high level of English. I mean, you're a you're. I would. You're a, fl- a fluent English speaker, right? So, when you speak, it's it's easy for me to Fine. understand you. If I were going to give feedback, it would more be to increase clarity and increase na- native sound right so so what is the yeah. the gap between fluent and native is it's pretty it's a pretty small gap so a couple things i heard there yeah. one uh, one of the things that i've noticed you do when you talk is you you use a, a repeated pattern of intonation so when you when you speak sometimes your voice goes up and then you repeat the same pattern of intonation again and a third time and a fourth time i think for example you said uh, at the end the rising tone of university association and it goes up in a little bit of a question tone dealing with american companies and it goes up in a bit of a question tone i think if you had more variation in the intonation from sentence to sentence just changing it up a little bit more it would it would mm-hmm. allow people to focus a bit more on each thing, mm-hmm. right? To 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 catch the points a little more mm-hmm. clearly, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I think mm-hmm. also there are, there were times and I was listening to you where you could mm-hmm. instead of going to the next thing use more pauses. I have a sense sometimes when you're speaking that you're rushing to get to the next word. And you'll use words mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. and and well to get to the next point. Mm-hmm. And I think it's okay mm-hmm. if you were to just pause for a second or two and give the mm-hmm. listener a little time to process the last thing before moving on. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I had the sense that I was always trying to catch up with your with the last thing you said, and I, I was a little behind. And so, for example, for our viewers here who are not mm-hmm. native speakers, mm-hmm. to yeah. give them, you know, a, a, a way to understand you very clearly, maybe using yes. pauses more would be good. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'm rushing. <laughs> a little, a little rushed. Yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Your pronunciation. You have really natural pronunciation. I noticed one sound is the D sound at the end of words. Sometimes you tend to use a slight T sound in, mixed in with the D, so it sounds a little mm-hmm. like, for example, you use the word board and it sounded a little more like bort instead of board with a mm. slight t sound and board. there were a couple of those in there so mm-hmm. just something to consider again i'm just saying all mm-hmm. of this mm-hmm. as a Wonderful. just a little feedback to be a little sp- specific but you're welcome to give me feedback as well the only <laughs> the only <laughs> thing i could the only thing i heard which i thought oh actually that's that's a a mistake a, 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 a technically a mistake i make mistakes all the time but um the use of well you said their level is well and we would want to use well typically as an adverb to describe an action as opposed to Mm -hmm. as opposed to a noun so you used it as an adjective that's it though i mean i um you, it's a tough job for me as to find to find things yeah. <laughs> to improve on. But <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. I, I yeah, think absolutely. you're a great example f- for for people. So, uh, can you tell? Can you remind me what age did you start 
speaking English, how old were you? Well, I was like maybe three, four, five. Yeah, little. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so I mean... Um, so I was there. Mm -hmm. How? Yeah. So, I mean, how does someone who's 20 who's starting improve? If you're, tw if yeah. I'm 20 years old and I'm just starting to try to improve my English now, what should I do? Right. <clears throat> well, well, my best suggestion would be like uh, again, you know, try to listen as much as you can and try to to speak. As much as you can, really. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have difficulty in finding partners, speaking partners, and I can see so many people are dealing with those, uh, you know, on the internet, like uh, iTunes or what, what was the name? I, I, I talk Cambly or there are so Cambly. Many. That's the I one talk. I was trying yeah. to think of mm -hmm. earlier today. Cambly. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Cambly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they are pretty useful. They are pretty useful in. Well, it will give them the chance to go over and talk. And practice, maybe. Yeah. Or, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I I remember writing you some things like, and well, I keep asking my students, please try to <clears throat> speak out loud while you're doing things like that. You yes. Remember the one that you were sharing with your friend, right? Yes. Well, somehow I really find it really like, okay, so what are my my plans are for tomorrow? Well, I'm planning to see my friend, have a cup of coffee, and come back and do things that, and we just all the Imagine things even will be perfectly applied for things like that. And Just yeah, speak everything uh, out. Yeah. Yeah. Out loud, get... Or they could just read out whatever the, the text they have, even the dialogues they have. Perhaps. But Different. don't you find? So I would. It seems like there are two different modes though right with the text one you're maybe working on pronunciation but when you're reading you're not really mm -hmm. engaging all of the machinery that you would need to s mm -hmm. express yourself mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah useful i yeah. think well yeah it's pretty useful mm -hmm. thank you so much for for coming on nahad i really appreciate it and uh well, uh, it's been it's been wonderful, and I can't believe it's true. Though. <laughs> well, we'll have to do another one. We'll have to do I, I another one of these sometime. <laughs> I'll be very happy. <laughs> I'll All right. be very happy. Wonderful. All right. I'm really, I'm gonna keep. Well, thanks a lot for you know letting me have you know join your what, your meeting or whatever you say. Thank you and, so much. Well, yeah. I'm hoping, looking forward to. Sure. Have a Great. good one. Thanks Talk to you later. And thank you for everyone for looking. Sure. Have a good one. All See right. ya. Interesting. Well, that's Nahad. Cool guy. I'll just say this. So thanks to Nahad. If you guys are brave enough to try that, let me know. Uh, uh, we didn't plan that. That was a sudden, spontaneous thing to just come on and talk, get feedback. I think it's very cool. I mean, uh, in general, just talking in front of people is is not something that everyone is comfortable with. But if you do that, it's... I found it to be very useful for myself, you know, doing live streams. Uh, but especially if you are, you know, learning a language to talk in front of others, to get yourself over any fear you might have. I don't think Nahat has any fear, but um, if you guys have that sense, just push yourself beyond it, and um, and you'll find that everything else gets easier. Right? The things that used to seem hard won't be hard anymore. If you guys haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button. Support the channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, check out the full courses in the links in the description. John Jin says, I've started to learn at 25 with zero words uh, after four years of taking the subway and reading books. There I can watch YouTube channels. Ah, okay. Taking the subway in which city? Sorry for that, but ESL learners always try to show off when they speak. That's why they try to speak faster. Well, I mean, how does it a very high level? John says it's not fair. He's been living in the U.S. Well, I mean, I know people who didn't live in the U.S. who still got got to a very high level. You know. We want a short video series on American society. Uh, Phila, I'm working on that. I'm working on American American culture course, which I'm very excited about. 
Duh, 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 duh. All right, well, I have a topic that I want to talk about that I would like to share with you. So let's get into that. And then if you have other questions, I'll try to get to those questions. Belarus. OK, cool. So it's very easy when you're trying to improve something to do what you feel is safe, to do what you feel is easy. And then after you do that, to feel like you've really made progress, to feel proud of yourself. Oh boy, I studied 25 words. Now I've remembered them. Great. Now I'm not saying that that's bad, but ask yourself how much that's really helping you achieve your goals. It's very important to connect your actions. If you're working on your English, and certain areas of your English to make sure that your actions are connected to your goals. So is, is learning 25 words connected to your goal if your goal is to memorize a bunch of words? I would say yes. <laughs> those are very closely connected. Knowing the words and remembering the words, those are connected. Is memorizing 25 words connected to your goal of becoming fluent in English? Maybe not so much. Maybe doing that and feeling good about yourself is just a way to stay in your comfort zone. But are you really getting better at speaking? Ask yourself that. So what I want to talk about is the importance of struggle, how you improve your English through struggle, and why struggle is actually a good thing. Struggle is an essential part of improvement. And I'd like you to think about your own experience. Think about anything that you're good at. Why are you good at anything that you're good at? That seems like a silly question at first. Why are you good at what you're good at? But think about it. I'll bet most of the things that you're good at, you got good at through some level of difficulty, some level of struggle and that you weren't just casually learning in the most comfortable possible way. I'll bet there were moments when it was a little painful, when you felt that uncomfortable feeling of, ah, I can't do this well. And then you pushed beyond it and improved. You pushed through struggle. So the, the best way to think about it, I think, is that struggle is kind of like a mountain climbing up a mountain. Let's say not climbing up a mountain. Let's say let's say it's a hike instead of a mountain, right? If you feel constantly a little out of breath and you feel like you're a little tired and you're breathing heavy and you're sweating a little bit, you are pushing yourself, right? The next step is not easy to take, but it's not impossible either. Well, then you're getting in better shape. You're improving your strength. But if you're just slowly walking down the road, a flat road like this, you're moving, you're burning some calories, but are you getting stronger? Are you getting in better shape? Eh, maybe not so much. So then go back to what things helped you improve in your life. What are you good at? And what did you have to do to get there? I'll bet, I'll bet you had to struggle. So when it comes to learning English, the important thing is to first identify what things you have to do that will actually have an impact on where you're trying to get. That's the first step, right? So struggle is necessary. We want to struggle. I want you to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. I want you to feel like you're climbing up a mountain or hiking up a mountain. It's a little difficult but not doing things that don't have an impact or are useless or are a waste of time. For example, if you wanted to remember the etymology of 10 words, the etymology is the sort of history and background of the words. Uh, it comes from Greek and then before that it had this origin and the whole history. That might be difficult to remember all of that. Is that useful? No, that has almost no connection 
to your goal of wanting to improve your English, your spoken English. Almost no connection, right? So what kinds of things do have an impact? Well, talking with people, having conversations, maybe reading books, maybe writing a blog, doing things with English, or learning English in a more active way, not just remembering 25 words, but making sentences which with each of the 25 words that you're learning, right? Remembering them actively. So first you want to identify the things that are going to get you where you want to go. And then, and then comes the, the struggle part, the, perhaps the most important part. Turn the knob up until it's almost too much. So I found the thing that's hard for me. I found the thing that's going to actually get me there, the thing that's useful, the activity, the exercise, the, the language partner, the routine, the whatever it is. And now I'm going to take that thing and increase it until it's almost too much. Turn the knob up means like a volume knob, increasing it until it's, oh, it's very hard, right? So maybe that means having a conversation publicly. Maybe that means joining a group of all native English speakers where you have to express yourself in a high pressure situation. Maybe that means taking an IELTS test. An IELTS test, difficult. Doing something like that, which puts you in a position of feeling like it's almost too much, but not quite. If it's too much, you'll feel overwhelmed. If it's not enough, it's too easy and you're not improving. So I want you to then think about now a couple of things you can do, a couple of activities that you can do, which really have an impact on your progress, and then think about how you can increase those in difficulty, turn the knob up until they're almost too much so that you feel, oh, that's a big challenge. It's a big struggle. I'll give you some examples of things in general, okay? What if you want to be better at baking? Well, instead of just baking by yourself, bake for your friends. Bake a cake for your friends, get feedback. Say, listen, I want honest feedback. Tell me what you think. Maybe you want to be better at photography. So don't just take photos randomly. Join a photo competition. See if you can win. See if you can get third place. Measure yourself. Maybe you want to be better at public speaking. Start a YouTube channel. Speak in public. Join an event like Toastmasters or a group like Toastmasters. Do something that has some external pressure. Maybe you want to improve your writing. Don't just sit there and write by yourself. Write a blog. Challenge yourself. Maybe you want to be more fluent. Meetup events are great. Join some meetups. Join a, a class, do a one-to-one -one class with a native English teacher. Get feedback from a teacher on a weekly basis. Put some money into your progress. Just push yourself in some way. Maybe you want to improve your vocabulary. Maybe that's your goal. Okay, don't just learn the words, write an essay. Write a blog. Do something with the words you're learning. Challenge yourself to use all 25 words that you learned in sentences, in context. Maybe you want to improve your listening. Next time you watch a movie, turn off the subtitles. Don't use the subtitles. Challenge yourself to understand what's going on by watching the movie by itself with no subtitles. Right? And maybe you miss a few things, but that's okay. That's part of the challenge. That's part of the struggle. So if you want to reach the top of the mountain, you have to actually climb it. And climbing it implies or suggests struggle. So my challenge to you is to take two or three things as a starting point. Activities, skills you want to improve. Find the things that you can do which will improve those things, like the examples I gave, and then make a plan to do them and make sure that they are a little scary, a little difficult, and not a, that's easy. Okay? And if you're right there in the balance between too difficult and too easy. If you're right there, you're going to be making progress faster. This is a faster way to improve not only your English, but other skills as well. And notice for some of those examples that having a little bit of outside pressure is good. Baking a cake for your friends. They give you feedback. A photo competition. Outside, outside opinions, outside feedback, and people looking at you, judging you. That pressure 
might be a little scary, but it can be a great thing. So good luck with that. If you have any questions, let me know. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. Also, it would really help out the channel if you hit the like button. That would be great. And also check out my full courses in the links in the description. All right. What things could you guys do to push yourself further, to feel slightly uncomfortable rather than feeling safe and comfortable? What things would those be? John Jin said, 10 points to Gryffindor. Not sure what that's all about. What questions have I missed? Could you ex please explain to me uh, what verb tense should I use when analyzing a novel, writing an essay? Um, you can probably use simple. Uh, you could probably use, yeah, you could probably use present simple tense. He says, he writes, he goes. It is, yeah, I think so. That would be okay. Sorry for that, but ESL learners always try to show off. Da, da, da. Okay, have I missed any questions, guys? Have I missed any questions? Oh, Vissal says, Vissal? Vissal. Vissal says, don't watch that movie if you have a weak stomach. What does it mean? Is that a common phrase? Yes, this is a good one. So weak stomach generally means that you can't handle something because you might get nauseous, meaning you feel a little sick, but that can be used in two different ways, physically or in terms of content, what you're willing to see or not willing to see, what makes you feel very uncomfortable. So for example, if we're talking about food, I have kind of a weak stomach. I try not to eat too many spicy dishes or I have a weak stomach I'm not able to drink more than one one bottle of beer for example so something related to food and drink physically your body is not able to handle it you get an upset stomach you feel sick you get stomach pains if you eat this certain type of food right or maybe very rich foods with tons of butter okay well that sometimes gives people an upset stomach if you have a weak stomach then maybe you can't handle that, right? So that would be a weak stomach. But what would the other type of weak stomach be? Why, why are we talking about don't watch that movie here? That would be if there's a movie that has a lot of violence, if there's a movie that has horrifying acts in it, things that would generally upset people. We, we use the stomach to talk about being emotionally upset or offended or disgusted by things that are not related to food, but are generally things out there that we see and hear. Maybe not so much here, but especially see, and especially acts, whether it's fictional or not. So, you might say, what would be a really violent movie? Don't watch the Saw franchise, the Saw movies, uh, if you have a weak stomach, because uh, people are cutting off other people's legs, and it's uh, scary, and there's a scary clown thing. I don't know. I haven't seen them, but I've heard that they're scary. So if you have a weak stomach, don't watch those. Okay. Now, some people might use it, might go even further and say things like, don't invest in this stock, which fluctuates up and down. It's very risky if you have a weak stomach. So that weak stomach might be your ability to tolerate risk and danger. So sometimes weak stomach is used in that way too. So it's very common. Again, it's used mostly for food and drinks. It's used for movies or things that we can see, which might be <gasps> horrifying, shocking, and also for things that might imply risk or have a lot of danger associated with them. I have kind of a weak stomach for extreme sports or I have a weak stomach for risk in investing. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Vissal, it's a good one. I appreciate it. Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And of course, of course, check out my full courses in the links in the description. All right. Hey. I would not recommend Six Flags if you have a weak stomach. That works. 
that works. That would be an extreme sport example. Please don't call me professor. Good God. Um, I would appreciate if you would answer my question about filling words. Where is your question? Uh, which one is better while you are using thinking during conversation? Using filler words or stop talking? Ah, ah, ah. Good one. Last question. Riketa, I don't think I'll be able to watch a movie this week, sadly. I want to get back to the movie thing, but uh, it's tough. We'll get back to it someday. Well, hopefully this year. This year we'll get back to it. Everything, everywhere says which one is better while you're talking during a conversation using filler words or stop talking at all i think the question is should i use filler words or should i stop talking should i pause instead of saying um well hmm like i guess well uh let me see Oh, yeah. Hmm. Like, those are filler words, okay? And in a conversation, people use them. I'm not saying you should use them, but I'm saying it's kind of unavoidable. So everyone uses filler words, right? No person uses no filler words. Everyone uses them. But that's not the question. The question is, what's better, right? Should, when I'm trying to think of something, should I say, um, uh, or should I just pause for a moment? Now, this is kind of subjective, okay? So, what I'm going to say is my opinion. That's all. It's my opinion that it's better to pause than use filler words. That's my opinion. And that comes from watching a lot of talks, listening to a lot of very good speakers speak, identifying what things allow certain good speakers to speak well. And the common trend, the common thread, the common idea is that in general, the people who speak very well are not afraid to pause for a moment. They don't feel afraid of doing that. And People who say, well, um, uh, a lot, often feel unconsciously afraid to have a break, to have people's eyes on them waiting for the next thing. But it doesn't have to be like that. So, to be clear, everybody uses thinking words. I use them sometimes. Um, you hear me use them. Go back and watch my videos. You'll see me use them. I can't avoid it. Everyone uses them. But if you're going to strive for something, strive for being able to express exactly what you want to express, when you want to express it. And if you need to take a pause to think about how to do that for a couple seconds, go ahead. And if you can get into the habit of doing that, right? this is something I'm working on too. If you can get into the habit of doing that, I think you'll thank yourself and you'll be happy that you did that. Because when you go back and you listen to what you said, if it's recorded, for example, you'll think, ah, yes, I'm glad I did that. I recently went back and listened to... So I have a... <coughs> I have a podcast. Excuse me for the cough. I have a podcast. And in my podcast, I started it a long time ago and then I recently started it again. And I noticed in the early ones, I am doing a lot of um, 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 um. But in the recent ones, I'm doing it much less because I've been trying to work on that. And I think that is more clear. I think it's easier to understand. I think it's better, my opinion, but better. So work on it by trying to express yourself, to communicate your opinions about things when you feel like there's a little pressure on you. And one way to do that by yourself is to just record yourself. Turn on your uh, camera and record yourself talking about a topic and just try to talk without using too many filler words and see how it goes. And you might use a lot and that's okay. But then the next time, try to do it less and less and less. That's my suggestion. 
Guys, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe. Also, check out the full courses in the links in the description. And also, if you don't mind, hit the like button because that really helps out the channel. Also, if you guys would like, or if any of you are interested, I posted a, this a video yesterday. You might have seen it. Um, I'll post it in the chat. I'll post it in the chat. I'll post it in the chat. Hold on. Let me do that. So I started, I relaunched my podcast. Now, just to be very clear, my podcast is not an, a language learning podcast. I have a podcast with my friend. His name is Matt. He lives in Seattle. He's a cool guy. Uh, and he is um, really interested in philosophy, psychology, uh, religion, mythology, and so am I. And we both read a lot about these things. What we do in the podcast, if you're interested, is we do long form conversations, long conversations about movies, but it's not like a movie review. So we'll talk about a movie and we'll pull out the cool ideas from the movie, the deeper ideas, the philosophy, the mythology, and we'll talk about those and play with them. And it's really fun for us. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, and if you want to support, you are welcome to, and we would really appreciate that. That would be so awesome. So I'm going to, in the chat right now, I'll pop in a link. If you'd like to support, you can, you can subscribe, and that would obviously be very appreciated um, to hit the subscribe button. And if you really like it and you want to support, then you can, um, then you can do the Patreon. See, I just did a thinking word there. I did um, right? You, you hear that? Um, um. But I can hear myself when I do it. So there's the link to the YouTube. And if you want to support on Patreon, you can do that too. We'd appreciate that, of course. But you don't have to, of course. Of course, of course, of course. It's fun, though. I really like it. Might be not interesting for a lot of people, though. Yeah, great talking to you too, Nahat. Thank you so much for... I'm glad you were willing to do it. It's very cool. Um, and appreciate all of you. Appreciate the great questions. And uh, if I missed any of your questions this time, then we'll have to do it in the next one. Um, and in the meantime, guys, find the thing that's difficult for you. Find your struggle and struggle, struggle, and struggle, and struggle, because struggle is good. All right, we'll call it a day. Thanks a lot, guys. Like button, subscribe. Check out the podcast if you're interested. Otherwise, check out my full courses in the links in the description, and I will see you next time.